I'm really, really pleased and uh, very grateful actually for, uh, for my colleague Kate who is organising this, but also for the participants and also for you for coming because this is our first, you know, Agon, if you like, um, which as you know, Agon is a space of dispute, it's a space of com um, discussion, it's a space, we didn't call it Agora because it sounds like, you know, it's the market and I don't like markets. So, well, I like the market, but the notion of the market these days means something else. But I mean, the, the notion of the Agon is an interesting one because I also always tell people, you know, when you talk about pedagogy, the Agon in the middle is, has to do not just with the leading, but also with the spaces within which we discuss and within which we even dispute in an agonistic way, not antagonistic way. And therefore, that's why we came up with the title of, uh, of an Agon. But I'm very pleased that uh, we're discussing, and uh, by way of showing, actually, um, what we're calling arts research. Because as you know, arts research is, is a very wide uh, concept, but also it has become increasingly carrying with it currency. As I keep saying, you know, in certain countries, actually, uh, like in Britain and uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, research is measured, and it's measured in quite a systematic way. And the artists and the practitioners were faced with that dilemma some time ago. And I remember I was there as a junior academic when it happened. And uh, that really focused our minds to think, what is arts research? And in that debate, what came out, which was really good, I think, uh, is the fact that we started valuing uh, both the practice, the intrinsic element of art, and art, the arts in themselves, in and of themselves, but also how the arts are affecting our lives and how they engage with other spheres of human activity. So I mean, I'm really pleased within that context because actually what we have today is, as you will see, is a variety of approaches um, to what we are calling arts research. And that's something which I'm really, uh, I think it's something which hopefully it would open more and more the uh, discussion. And also the idea is that we all share and understand and learn from each other's experience and each other's uh, research and practice. So without further ado, um, I want to invite Kate here, who's going to introduce our speakers. And uh, thank you for coming, and uh, let's have a good time and enjoy it. It's really our pleasure to host this event. Um, we have five brave groups who are going to present today and try to keep their presentations to 10 minutes, which is really hard when you think about the, the, the months and sometimes years that have gone into the work and all the thought that's gone into writing, the paper, so no, not, a, not a small challenge. Um, the way this is going to work is that um, each of our presenters will come up and give a talk and we'll have all five groups present. So first of all, we're going to have um, the Evie Baskin professor, uh, Henry Jewell, from the Department of Art History, who's going to be speaking uh, about an exhibition on Yoruba masquerade arts. And next, I'll just go, to, I'll just go through the list. And next, we're going to have Professor Joe Koika from the Dance Department, who will be speaking about a collaborative electroacoustic music and sound work of his. Third, we'll have Associate Professor Kate Vieira from the Department of English, who's going to uh, talk about a study that she's done about how expressive writing can promote healing. Um, fourth, we will have Professor Mark Nelson from Design Studies, Interior Architecture, who's going to be presenting some of his work. Um, um, it's an exploration of otherworldliness um, by painting on woven brocade of fabric rather than flat campus canvas. There's a lot more to all of these presentations, but I don't want to steal their thunder. So, um, And to round us up, we're going to have two graduate students. We have Casey Counselor, who's from the Department of Communication Arts, and Jason Cartes, who's from the Art Department. Um, and they're going to be talking about the ac uh, sorry, Applied Act, which is the Applied Comics Kitchen. Um, so, after they've all spoken, they will be able to come up here. So save your questions and, and thoughts. Um, they'll come up here and then we'll have, you'll have a chance to ask questions. And after that, um, we'll just start, we'll just do mingling and free chatting. So if there's someone you want to talk to directly. Um, if you haven't already, I encourage you to, to get a name tag, um, especially because there are, I'm thrilled to say there's many people here that I haven't even met and I would like to get to know you and so would everyone else. Um, also, if you aren't on our regular email list about arts research or other arts institute um, matters, there's also a little sign up pad over there, so please go ahead and, and write your name. And one, just one more thing to mention is that we're already planning our next Arts Agon because we're lucky enough to have um, some people signed up, who, people who we couldn't um, accommodate today. So we're looking at February 15th, and um, that will 
that will you'll we'll, we'll be sending out more details about that. Okay, so without further ado, why don't we start off with Henry? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good. That's a good response because I am taking you to the land of call and response, that is Africa. Um, I'm going to greet you with Yaraba to welcome you, Ekabo. Ekabo. Now, your response for that is very complicated. I hope you can get it. It's O Ekabo. O Ekabo. All right. Yeah, all right. You, know, you don't even have to repeat the Ekabo, just the O. Keep it as simple as possible. And with a little bit more enthusiasm, please. Ekabo. O. Oh. That's better. All right. So, um, today I have a simple task to bring you to your senses and your sense abilities. Because what I'm going to talk to you about is work that I'm doing um, with uh, an approach I call <coughs> sensiotics, which is the study of the crucial role of the senses in how we make sense of the world, how we are shaped as persons, as members of culture and as actors in history. Um, the, the senses, as I would define them, are um, the primary mode of understanding that begins in the body. And that body is a unified system with our minds, with our brains and our minds. Body affects mind, mind affects body. Um, and we are the product of both our DNA, what we bring to the world, and then how those DNA elements are shaped by culture. It's that synthesis of both nature and culture. And I came to this approach of sensiotics because of an apprenticeship that I did with a, 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 a sculptor a Yoruba sculptor when I was a teacher in Nigeria many years ago. And I realized that uh, it wasn't the words or explanations he gave me, but the fact that I needed to embody those carving techniques in order to understand Yoruba art and culture at a deeper level. Um, and so I've kind of I've, I've taken that experience, that body, my experience, and um, are presenting it in the form of sensiotics. Now, um, today I'm going to be giving you examples from my work uh, among the Yoruba people who live in West Africa, mostly southwestern Nigeria. Um, and a, a recent project that is in process right now, and that is an exhibition of a Gungun masquerades. These are masquerades that honor the spirits of the departed, of ancestors. And I'll give you a summary of that at the, at the end. Every culture understands and classifies the senses in a different way. For the Yoruba, from my research, I've defined seven that are important. The typical five plus another two, the sense of motion, movement, and the sense of altered state of consciousness, which I would call suprasensory perception. It's often called extrasensory perception, but suprasensory perception. Today, I'm going to focus on three of those senses, motion, sight, and hearing, as I'm trying to incorporate them into this exhibition in the design gallery trying to make a museum exhibition come alive and become multisensorial and interactive. So uh, we start with the sense of motion. And the Yoruba have some wonderful sayings about motion. Uh, let's see if I can find <coughs> it. It is OK. Um, and that sense of motion uh, is captured in a Yoruba saying, Stretch out your leg and let dance catch it. They give life and, and agency to the sense of motion. The Yoruba also say about motion that not standing still is dancing. 
So, uh, since most of you academics have been sitting at your desks, like I have, we're going to start with the sense of motion. I'll ask you all to stand up, and you're going to be listening to Ricardo Lembo, Mambo Yo-Yo, find your mambo rhythm in his music, and get your move on. Mambo Yo-Yo, Mambo Yo-Yo. about to see are some examples of Yoruba uh, Egungu masqueraders. Uh, these are constructions of multiple layers or lappets of textile that families produce. And here is one of the wonderful examples that will be in the exhibition. It's in the Helen, thanks, thanks. Uh, our, uh, that's in the Helen Louise uh, textile collection. Um, and it comes from Yarrabah land. We know the compound, we know the family, because these are family collaborative creations that come out at least once a year to celebrate and honor ancestors. And each year, more layers of cloth are added on. The oldest are underneath, the newest fashionable, most fashionable textiles from the global market uh, are added on periodically. Um, and the choreography, of these Egungu masquerades is circular. They whirl around, and those panels fly outward on the air. And as the Yoruba say, that's creating a breeze of blessing. It's a blessing and a prayer from the spirits of ancestors who have moved to a different level of existence, but are still engaged in the lives of their descendants in the world. So motion, movement, the breeze that's created by these masqueraders is part of the message, a very important message uh, in, uh, in the performance itself. That's, that's how these blessings and prayers take place. Um, it's also a reference to the breeze of voice, of sound, because for the Yoruba, spoken words have a shape that has performative power. So you have to think carefully. Yorubas have a saying that they say, a curse reflects before it's sent. You want to know that you're right in sending powerful words towards somebody um, in order for, uh, before uh, you are, you're, you're doing it. Um, all right, here's another example. I'm already down to two minutes, so this is going to be a fast world. An example of another a Google in performance whirling. And we're going to try to give a sense of that, that, uh, that motion. Here's a third masquerader that's going to be in the exhibition. Um, its owner and collector um, affectionately calls it Pizza Man. <laughs> that's not its original <coughs> name, but you will see why it is called Pizza Man. <laughs> <laughs> just a short excerpt from the big film that you will see in the exhibition. It's from the annual festival in Porto Novo 
um, uh, that was filmed in 2014. Um, another type of egungun, like that first one that you saw, and others that will be in the <coughs> exhibition is Also, at the time of the exhibition, we're going to be hosting an Egungu ensemble uh, from South Carolina, from the Yoruba village called Oyotunji. A troop of 10 masqueraders, musicians, and singers will come uh, to perform during the symposium that's going to take place on April 6th and 7th. Here's the summary of the activities, the exhibition whirling return at the Design Gallery, opening on the 25th with a reception and then a two-day symposium on arts of honoring ancestors, arts and actions. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joseph Koykar, the music director for the dance department. I also happen to be a composer and have written music for the concert hall, film, TV commercials, and of course, a lot for dance throughout many years. I also am a musician that's worked extensively with electronic music, computer music, eh, since the early 1980s. So, uh, anyway, today I'm going to give you a little look at a recent collaborative work called When Time Ran Out, and uh, it was done along with two collaborators, Xu Xing Fan from the theater department and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Karen McShane Hellenbrand, and it was premiered in April of uh, 2017. So, uh, the process was that I selected two science fiction stories. One was called Repent Harlequin said the Tick Tock Man, the other one was called uh, Not With a Bang by Damon Knight. Both of those dealt with uh, what I consider some rather interesting uh, concepts of, that are facing society and the human race, and you can read about them there. So, um, once I created a script. We thought, okay, now we can go. Uh, so really there are two studio produced elements. That is my soundtrack, 15 minutes long, and Xu Xing's video projections and computer animations. The live element, of course, is the uh, dance choreography. So to give you an idea of all this stuff, let's take a look at the opening. is done, how music production is done. Uh, the main tool is a digital, digital audio workstation. I use Digital Performer. And um, this Digital Performer 9, version 9, is basically a giant multi-track tape recorder that allows you to record audio, what's known as MIDI data, and edit it, put it together. Just great. For me, it's a composer's pen and paper. Uh, this little movie will show you how it works, you can see all the tracks. Uh, hear the sound. See how this is all organized on a personal computer.
today. So, um, another interesting aspect of doing this kind of work is you have to gather sounds. Um, I use a program called Mach 5, which is great. It allows you to record, well, let's say bring in digital recordings of any type of sound, be it music or sound effects. And for this production, I collected hundreds of industrial mechanical sounds, went through a selection, organized them in this program called Mach 5, and edited it, manipulated it. This is the same approach that all the Hollywood people do. So you can see program, grandfather clocks being played. I scroll down, find a ticking watch. All these are sounds used in this. Check that out. I trigger it, manipulate it, slow it down. Very cool. All right. Uh, the next section here deals with more of a musical material. Um, so I decided to add some music. Most of this soundtrack is really sound design. Okay. But I decided to take some string quartet music of mine that I wrote many years ago, arrange it for synthesizers, and then plug it in at certain moments. For this, I used a software tool called Pro Tools, ubiquitous kind of program used in audio recording, film, you name it. And uh, great, it works so well. Let's listen to a little bit of that segment. I'd just like to show you a little bit about how all this is mixed. Uh, again, I go back to Pro Tools, I take all the audio and the final version, stick it into Pro Tools, and adjust the tracks, the volumes, etc., etc. And of course, this is also great because it's all non destructive editing. So once all this is done, you're then able to mix maybe 50, maybe 100, whatever tracks down to the final stereo mix down, which the audience will hear. So here's a little segment. segment of when time ran out and um, this will for sound wise it has a very interesting little effect I did on the kind of clicking ticking watch you'll hear it just as you see these little wavy lines flatten out you'll hear the watch slow down so uh, as, as well as everything will come to a conclusion so for me this kind of piece is great to show you that sound is music, music is sound, and if you want to see it live, because it's really meant to be seen live, as you can see up there, as they say, check it out. So here we go. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I, I see it. <laughs> Let me just go back to where I go here. Okay, okay. Let's bounce there somehow. Get back to my little slide there and show you that. There we go. 
in the English department and um, this is my first time in the arts community so thank you. My previous work has to do with um, immigration and literacy and recently I've um, come to be interested in this idea of whether expressive writing can help people heal. So that's the question that I want to explore today. Um, there's a lot of evidence that um, it can heal. First of all, um, a lot of self-help books say yes, expressive writing can heal. Um, and there are also a number of scientific studies that say yes, um, expressive writing can heal. Psychologists have shown that it helps to release emotional stress resulting in improved physical health. And there have been some crazy scientific studies that show um, that writing can reduce the symptoms of asthma, <laughs> high blood pressure. It can even, um, there was this study done in New Zealand that showed that even um, wound puncturing, like they punctured people's skin, right? And if you wrote, their, your time to heal was less, so it's anyways, <laughs> interesting stuff. Um, anyway, this is all kind of developing against the backdrop of developments in MRI technology, which have um, enabled neuroscientists to document the connection between um, the mind and the body. Uh, but we still understand relatively little about the conditions under which writing can heal. Um, and I'm in the field of writing studies, um, and in um, the field of writing studies, we have, we've seen how bodies can help people write. We write um, with our hands, with our eyes, et cetera. But how might writing help the body? Um, and so my question is here, under what pedagogical conditions might people experience writing as healing? That is, how can we design uh, pedagogical activities for people to heal through writing? So as, um, to start to answer this question, I developed a small scale qualitative um, research study of a writing workshop that I led in conjunction with a therapeutic physical education retreat. Um, and this was for women healing from physical trauma. And the writing workshop, which um, I called Writing from Your Core, was aimed at heightening awareness of the relationship between body and mind um, with the idea that it could help enhance women's experiences of physical healing during the retreat. And so what I want to do is share just a little bit about this study and then talk about how I think this could expand into some future directions that um, I and some graduate students are working on. So um, I led this body-based writing workshop with an immersive therapeutic physical education retreat in a remote area of Baja, California, Mexico. Um, women came to the retreat not for a vacation, but because they had the intention to heal and they were healing from a variety of um, physical trauma, surgeries, chronic back pain, um, et cetera. The official program included four hours of physical education a day um, led by a former health lawyer, 
um, and body therapist, and one hour a day of the writing workshop, which I led. Um, so the goal of healing through body work and writing was shared, explicit, there was kind of buy-in from the get-go. Um, so I want to say a little bit about how I developed this syllabus, and I have copies of the syllabus if people are interested um, to pick up later. Um, to develop the, syllab the syllabus, I synthesized work from um, psychologists, dance scholars, um, kinesiologists, and um, compositionists. Um, and the goals here were to deepen mental and physical awareness and to help people change their experiences of the body. Um, and so the syllabus um, roughly looked like this. And I don't know if this is a crowd that cares about methods, so maybe I'll just you can I'll just skip this if you wanna if you wanna ask me about methods. Um, I can I can talk about how I collected my methods. But it's a qualitative project, and I ran the workshop twice so that the second time I could kind of incorporate um, what I learned the first time around to see if we could get to those um, healing outcomes. And um, here's where we wrote. So I found that four aspects of the writing workshop contributed to participants' experiences of healing. And these were the four aspects. And here I was really trying to kind of nail down what it was about writing um, and language in particular that could help people in their healing processes. And so what I want to do today is just really focus on narrative, and I can talk about the other ones later, but I just wanted to kind of give you an example of how this worked for one person. So um, according to um, a lot of psychiatric research, recovering from trauma is in part achieved through constructing a narrative in which one is an agent and not a victim. So this is why people who manage to save themselves or find some agency in traumatic situations like war tend to experience less um, PTSD than those who were rescued. So the question that I was curious about is whether the embodied practice of writing an agent of narrative might help people feel emotionally and physically stronger. Um, and so I want to address this question through a participant um, who I'll call Faith. Um, and Faith was an artist, a visual artist, who came to the, the retreat for what she described as a reset from chronic back problems. And so I'll walk you through just some of her writing here to show um, the transformation in her writing and how she experienced this transformation. Um, in her first piece of writing about the body, um, Faith describes suffering from bullying in school, so we kind of went back, and this is what she wrote. Um, she talked about escaping from the bullies by um, kind of this escapist building houses in sand so that she could be a world away from the thing that scared me. Um, on the next day when we were to write about strengths and scars, the image of the bully reappeared. Um, so she described, um, when she was talking about a scar, she described this time that she fell down and her father had to, had to rescue her. And remember, being rescued isn't necessarily an empowering thing in relation to recovering from trauma. But then in a description of a strength, she returned to the bullies and talked about a time that she saved herself. So um, in middle school, there was this bully that told her that she was going to beat her up, um, beat her up after school. And this is what she wrote about that experience. And you can see kind of the physicality of, of this. Um, and you can hear the disempowering language here. But ultimately, she used her mind and body to outsmart the bully. So she challenged the bully to a game of marbles and said, OK, if, if you win, you can beat me up. If I win, I get to walk. <laughs> and this is what happened. All right, okay, so on the fourth day, we were to imagine the body's potential to do something that we would like to do but maybe couldn't quite yet. This is the fiction part of the writing workshop, right? We're imagining ourselves in the future. Um, and the idea was to imagine and embody our own power. And I asked people first to do this in the second person, um, and I kind of played with the grammar to see what those effects were based on cognitive linguist um, Bergen's idea that, that metaphor um, and grammar can really shape our motor responses. So I started out in the second person and this is what she imagined. She imagined herself like um, in Kung Fu Panda. Okay, so then um, I asked participants to revise this into the first person. 
right? So then they could it could be kind of more fully part of them. <coughs> um, and you can kind of feel the difference here in the first person. Um, and then on the final day um, for poetry, um, we asked um, our bodies what they would say to us, and she wrote this. My body says you have the power, just tap into it. So the narrative movement in her writing was this, from escaping and being rescued to rescuing herself. Um, and um, after a follow-up interview, um, she wrote, um, she told me, it was a milestone for me that I could get through a week of this kind of intense body work. Having to sit down in a writing workshop that I was reluctant to go to in the first place and being asked hard questions was an opportunity to get it up and out. I've been squashing it forever, the bullies. The writing told me I didn't have to be such a whip, and I'm thinking, I have back pain, but I can just handle it. I really felt like I effing powered through. Mm -hmm. um, so here um, is an example of how the composing of a narrative um, described a trajectory from victim to victor, from weak to strong, and brought an awareness to this inner power um, that she called on to physically persist. Okay, and just briefly, um, the other aspects that, that folks experienced um, as empowering was a metaphor. And if you want to know the story behind the, the dolphin carcass, I can tell you later. Um, but it's, it's relevant. Um, language worked to integrate um, mind and body. And also environment and art was really important. Um, connecting to the environment and seeing that people were kind of attached to something bigger than themselves um, and also sharing poetry. So I have like 30 seconds left, so let me just sit 30 seconds, yes. Um, in sum, this is my conclusion. And then a couple future directions. Writing is both personal and social. So I was curious how this worked in other um, environments. Um, so I'm leading a team of graduate students who's working with community groups. Um, and I'm leading a group for Latino after school, um, an after school program for high school students. And this is some of the embodied writing that they have done. Um, and I'm also interested in the relationship of writing to peace and currently am um, applying for a grant to go to Columbia to um, look at body-based writing as a way to help youth peace and peace education. And my time's up. Thank you. Thank you. So it's great to see everyone here. Um, I'm Mark Nelson. And uh, yeah. I'm going to look at how these recurring ideas have, have kind of pushed me through uh, research over many, many years. And rather than looking at a, a current project, just or just a current project, I'm going to show how I got there and just how it, how it's all about asking questions. And so some of the, it seems like a long list of themes, but over I don't know, it's been 40 years, 30 years. <laughs> is every year you add a little half a theme, and the, so but bodies, I think I'm related to to some of the other the previous ones because bodies are very important to me. And um, and I, I my training was as an architect. Um, on my graduate work anyway, my undergraduate was as a musician, and I sort of try to combine those. But then scale shift, sonic distortion, um, I love distortion in music, and uh, uh, things taking things out of context, optical color mixing. Um, and then another theme is artwork that cannot be reproduced or photographed, which is sort of death, you know, as a commercial. <laughs> but to me, it's always, it's like, uh, it goes back to uh, uh, Walter Benjamin and all those people like, you know, maybe, maybe we shall be trying to do artwork that can't be like that. Um, blurring the lines between digital and non-digital, and then I'm um, collaborating with auto-fictional colleagues. So my two colleagues did not come with me, but Elk Norseman often does, and um, uh, my street art colleague, Cremo, is often here as well. So uh, I uh, decided, I got a degree in music, I decided to go to school of architecture. Somehow I got in, and I didn't realize that you needed to know how to draw. I had never drawn a line in my life. Um, so what did I do when I got out of school? A year later, I was working as an architectural illustrator <laughs> because I was interested in, like, I was very intrigued by something I knew nothing about. And so I did this stuff, photorealistic things. Um, this is just a sketch, a practice sketch. This isn't the final. The final is much more. Um, and it's, and I, I like the idea of distortion. Ink, you can distort it. Watercolor, uh, more recent. This one's ultra clean. Um, and then just doing, I love the, the, the the um, automatic writing elements of these. So they just start mm -hmm. scribbling on a page and all of a sudden figures start to appear. So it's sort of like the, the writing exercise. So, um, and then this is more uh, focused. And then taking things out of context and scale, these are large French cuffs that showed up in the woods. It's about uh, class uh, so, uh, gentrification of the North Woods. Uh, and, I, and I also started looking then at buildings abstractly. Um, I started, you know, architecture got a little boring. 
Um, so I started thinking, well, what if the, you look at the body as a, or the building as a body? So you've got id, ego, superego, and it sort of looks like it has some kind of uh, organ there. I'm not sure what gender that is, but um, it's. <laughs> so I spent a lot of years looking at that stuff. And then I started thinking about how you could, this is the Museum of Temporary Art in Chicago. I thought maybe if you thought about it in a previous life, uh, they, they would have nipples and tongues and jewelry and stuff. And then how you portray that in a, a less technical way, even though this is actually a computerized drawing. And the, the egg, you know, tomb of modernism, tomb of modern architecture. Then looking at uh, just what if there's a gallery somewhere where they've taken all the body parts off the buildings and put them somewhere. Um, and at the same time, I was trying to figure out how to uh, express things in a digital format because this is a this is actually an AutoCAD drawing, believe it or not. It's an AutoCAD drawing, and I think this is maybe 10 years old, something like that. I was trying to get uh, the skin on the walls. And I thought, well, let's create our own journal. So I created an official piercing and tattoo. It's like my journal. And then uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, boring building. Maybe you need some jewelry. Um, and then I was looking at Whistler's uh, tea room and somehow came up with this thing. And then also trying to uh, translate the idea of uh, distortion and sonic distortion into the physical form. And uh, so this is a, a, a little piece, a, a reliquary for um, the Northern Pike Guy Killed in Eight. Um, along with some deer antler. And did a large uh, eight foot diameter pierced nipple along with a Clay Soldenberg print. Um, and I was trying to, and then I was always thinking about the body and then I, I got back to the body and I started producing these large pieces. These are like 40 by 60 based on charcoal drawings. And this is kind of how it worked. They start with the charcoal drawing and then add layers of color and stuff. And then actually then it started, it, it started creating connections between them. Um, broke the process down. Then I started working with Poser. I kept thinking about the body. And is anybody familiar with Poser? Um, it's a software, and so this is a digital model, and that's supposed to be my head on there. And uh, uh, I thought this was kind of interesting, you know, because all of a sudden I wanted to do motion. I was a musician. I wanted to do motion. I was sick of doing drawings, sick of doing buildings. Um, and I thought, but everybody's using it photorealistically. And, um, let's see. So then I thought, well, let's go back to my ink roots and then use Poser to make things that are sort of fuzzy. Um, and so I started doing that. And then, but then I started looking at the stills. I thought, let's, look, let's go back to the things I like doing. And then this is just a digital model. Um, I thought, oh, yeah, photorealistic. Well, kind of boring. So then I thought, well, what if I start taking it back to my ink roots? And this is large. It's like this size. And it's all this ink on there. It's partly digital, <coughs> partly not. Started looking at. Uh, more bodies and created these characters. These are all avatars. There's Lonnie and Roy. I created a whole narrative about them. And I just kept looking at layering, how you can get things to go in there. Lonnie and Roy. Um, but then this stuff was a little bit too clean again. But these are all digital. So, you know, I showed the, the ink stuff wasn't. That's, that was hand. Um, then, that, then I thought, I want to go big. You know, I like the building thing. So this is just a mock up. So I haven't done this. Um, but then my most recent work. Um, I, I started taking them and using stencils and basically street art techniques. And these are big pieces. These were just in a show over uh, Union South, uh, eight feet tall. Um, and they're the same avatars that I was using, working with previously. And then I was really looking at multiples. And it's the same image, but how it changes as it changes scale. And also um, the way each, they're, they're actually monoprints. They're all from the same stencil, a group of stencils but also how you would layer things. Um, and going back to, I can tie on to everybody, like, uh, I think Henry's thing about the, the layered garments. These are really layered paintings because you, the, uh, the layer underneath is actually a piece of cloth that you kind of lose. Um, then I, so these were avatars. Then I thought, well, let's branch out. Uh, I've been doing some of these avatars for so long. And this was actually a shrine for a friend of mine who committed suicide and she was very Catholic. Um, and so this is, and her name was Mary, so this is Mary. So this one I drew. Uh, so that wasn't digital. And then I started looking at ways to take the figure. And so the, um, it's digital image, but then it's broken up. Um, so down at the, the bottom there, there's all this texture. It took a, this was a hand cut stencil. It took a long time to cut that thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, for this show, I started using uh, laser cutting. It started to make more sense because uh, you have to spend so much time in Photoshop to set these up anyway. That's how I always did it, for drawing them. So then I just uh, started looking at shrines, the idea of shrines, transcendence. Um, and just how uh, you can take the same image and just totally transform it each time you change its context or uh, scale and what it's on. And the way um, the image melts with the background. This was a piece of plywood I found in the, in the trash. Um, and I, it actually was in a, sh except for a show in Australia, 
Uh, but then I found out there's import restrictions and it would have had to sit in quarantine for two months. <laughs> so I had to redo it and pretend like that was the one I wanted to do. Um, and then this is, a, this is actually the, the uh, cloth-based stuff that um, is actually the tag thing on my talk. And this is sort of where I'm at now. And what it is, is uh, there's a, a broad key piece of cloth and that's the pattern that you can kind of see behind everything. And it actually is red and then paint on that and uh, pr do a primer and then use lace patterns to create the pattern in the back and with different colors. So there's probably three layers of lace there. Um, and then on top of that goes several different stencils. And part of this is uh, going back to creating art that you can't reproduce. It, it, I use the metallic paints and as you walk by it, sometimes the pattern in the fabric comes to the front and you lose the figure. So it's, it's very interactive that way. Um, I, I probably could try it with lenticular prints. Uh, that's something I started to do years ago and I've never really finished with. Um, and then I started uh, going out from the avatars. I created more avatars. Of course, this is another Claudio B. He's one of my other uh, collaborators. Um, and it's all about the hair, right? Um, and so these are two different versions of the same one. And just how it, the background becomes different. And then also creating little shrines to go with them. And, and they, those get painted the same way. Of course, with uh, Claudio, it's a, uh, uh, a Norelco razor, of course, because it's about hair and grooming. Um, and creating these other little shrines. This one's sort of a, a wedding uh, thing, or the, the weekend trip to Paris that was bigger than your expectation, you know. <laughs> um, and then just, uh, you know, I can go on with that, but I think what, what I, in my 10 minutes, which are almost up, I thought I, I would try to show that those themes carried, and that was over about a period of 30 years, maybe, something like that. And here you can really see how on this one, this piece is uh, six feet tall. Um, and that brocade pattern is in the back, and it just somehow, um, and then the, the lace patterns behind there, you can't, you, it, the one pattern comes in front of the other, and if you saw each color by itself, the individual paint colors, it's just spray paint from the hardware store. So it's like street art, you know, just spray paint. And, but it, it takes on this whole new thing once you start layering all these different things. And um, um, so I'm hoping to now to, to uh, branch out and do it on buildings. Hopefully you'll see some at construction sites maybe in Madison. <laughs> Madison isn't as graffiti friendly as like Milwaukee. So, um, so I might have to t become a muralist. Yeah. And, or, so that's it. I think I beat okay. my time. My name is Jason Cortez. I'm Casey Counselor. And um, we are just one very small part of the Applied Comics Kitchen. Um, and we're talking on behalf of everybody today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm recovering from a cold, so I'll do my best, uh, but I won't be able to speak that much more. Um, so I'm uh, <clears throat> a third year MFA candidate in the art department. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist working um, a lot in comics, and I'm writing a book for my, as part of my MFA thesis. I'm also Linda Berry's uh, teaching assistant. Um, my own personal research revolves around American popular culture, um, comic books, something called the dime novel. Um, I was the Horatio Alger Jr. Fellow for the study of American pop culture in uh, Northern Illinois. Um, and this is just a sample of some of my own personal work. Um, I also have an installation on University Avenue in the uh, Wisconsin Institute of Discovery right now. Um, that's sort of street art related. Um, so I'm going to cover a lot of things pretty quickly. Um, the Applied Comics Kitchen was started by Dr. Ebony Flowers in conjunction with um, Casey and Linda Berry. Um, Dr. Flowers uh, worked with um, comics and also uh, started a program in conjunction with Linda Berry called Drawbridge, which is um, drawing with kids as co-researchers. It's something that um, the majority of the members of Applied Comics Kitchen have all been a part of in one form or another. Um, and her PhD dissertation, this is the cover of it, and it is one of the first, if not the first, um, PhD dissertation in comic form. Um, Drawbridge, something I've done for many years, um, Casey as well, Linda Berry as well. Um, 
and it involves with uh, combi combinatory play. So um, learning about play, learning about drawings from kids, copying drawings. Um, Saturday Science happens at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery um, in the image in Linda Berry's Image Lab. Uh, same kind of idea. Um, so Applied Comics Kitchen is uh, Borghese Mellon um, sponsored workshop in the Center for Humanities. And I'm just going to go over the different members. Um, Liz Anna Kozik, um, <clears throat> Environment and Resources PhD student at the Nelson Institute. Janelle Johnson, Dr. Janelle Johnson, um, Mellon Morgridge, Professor of the Humanities and Communication Arts. Um, That's us. <laughs> this is us. <laughs> Again, um, we have a website with more like profiles on it as well. Um, Linda's there too. Um, there are a couple other members who I don't think are up here. Uh, Anne Fink, who's a um, professor of feminist biology and um, a fellow at the Center for Healthy Minds currently. Um, Dr. Ebony Flowers. Um, Lisa Rodriguez, um, PhD in Hispanic Literature, and Casey. Uh, so I'm a PhD student in Communication Arts, and I'll be graduating um, in May. And I'm not writing about comics. Um, I don't study comics. I'm not making a comic dissertation. And I didn't, um, these are a couple of pieces here, but I hadn't taken an art class uh, since I think the early 90s, until about four years ago. Um, and I really like a clicker. Oh yeah, so uh, four years ago, those are the very, very first drawings I did in a class with Linda Berry that I found myself in. And the, my experience of being in that class has radically transformed my life in a number of ways that I won't um, get fully into, but not the least of which is that I, this blows my mind and humbles me still, but that from four years ago I'm drawing like that and still uh, not a perfect drawer by any means, um, but I have a book of um, graphic memoir uh, comics, a, a big book coming out soon um, about my experiences uh, as a transgender person in the world. Um, so, and a memoir that expands beyond me as an individual. So, and it was really the, the practice of drawing that has um, allowed me to even transition at all. So in terms of drawing yourself into being and healing the body, um, it's been central. So uh, my mission in the world right now, at least, is to give as many people this experience as possible, um, this transformative experience of drawing and also writing. And the Applied Comics Kitchen is a big part of that. So I wanted to show um, a few of the, the different workshops that we've Put on. Um, we invite artists to come in. These are open to the public and people from all different disciplines. So um, that people who are in chemistry, for example, um, have the experience of drawing that they can then take back to their classrooms and their labs, uh, maybe in new ways. So Veronica Burns was here. She's a graduate from UW-Madison um, in chemistry. So she did a workshop. Um, Oliver Bendorf, who is a poetry fellow here now, um, brought his comics wagon and we drew poetry comics. Recently, Anders Nielsen was here, and you can see we're in the comics room up in the top there. He did a storytelling workshop. Uh, Justin Hall was here last week. He did a few different events on campus, um, but we did a sequential desire uh, erotic comics workshop, and we drew, um, you can see us there in the corner drawing vegetables, um, <laughs> which is as far as we got, but uh, one of the more interesting experiences I've ever had. So we offer these workshops, and in the, uh, we're planning for the spring right now, but a big one is bringing M.K. Zerwick uh, from Chicago, who is comics nurse, this is her moniker. She's one of the founders of graphic medicine as a genre. And she'll be here um, doing a, a big event at the nursing school that will be interdisciplinary. Um, so that's a lot of what we do, is to create these interdisciplinary spaces for people to um, engage in art, um, to draw and to come in with having no experience having done that. Uh, and 
what I want to talk about for the, the rest of the time here is is another um, big component. So we focus on, on using drawing in teaching and also drawing in research. Um, so I'm going to talk about the teaching component here. So I teach courses, I just came um, right before coming here, um, I teach a 120 person lecture on digital communication. So today I'm teaching college students about YouTube, which was, it seems a little <laughs> so, but we, um And we start every class by drawing self-portraits. Um, so I get 120 um, pictures at the beginning of class. And I do it in every single class I teach and lead workshops um, for people in all different disciplines um, to, to figure out how they can use drawing in their classrooms. And Kate, I think I worked with one of your graduate students and how she can use drawing um, as a part of working with her, um, the group she's working with around healing and writing. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and there are a number of us involved in ACT who do that. Um, teach others either how they can use it for a particular assignment or give them the experience, um, come in and, and guest um, host workshops in their classrooms too. Uh, and I wanted to just mention three main um, benefits that I found in, in using drawing in the classroom that I think are pretty profound. And there are at least 50, but I'll give you three. Uh, one is that it creates this classroom culture, especially at such a big university. Um, so I had a student, these are actually pictures from, from my class currently, um, but a student a couple years ago said, and it's been echoed many times, I think we all felt a little vulnerable drawing ourselves in ridiculous ways, but in a way that made us more relatable to each other, which I thought was important because we covered some heavy topics. And we, um, you know, I'm teaching courses in rhetoric and communication and, and politics, so we're talking about gun violence, we're talking about sexual assault, and so it creates this, um, this bond between the students and a classroom culture that has it then easier for us to take on um, uh, topics that are otherwise really, really difficult to talk about. Um, another thing is just increasing participation and engagement. That everyone is participating right away. Um, this student was really quiet, and he said, I started to notice that by drawing, I immediately felt involved in the class and was more willing to participate in the conversation. And I don't, you probably can't read this here, but it says, um, whether it was making a joke about my drawing to my classmates or really getting into something that relieved stress, it helped me. I immediately was in a better mood and was learning more in discussions. And then the last piece that I'm really interested in right now is the ability to communicate trouble. Mm -hmm. That a student can, can communicate, she said, uh, I felt like you could see into my mind without me having to say something. So she could communicate to me that that's how she's doing. Um, or clearly this person, everything is messed up, terrible day, unhappy, or whatever it is that they're dealing with, it ends up coming up in the pictures in a way that they may not talk about otherwise. So um, as far as we're concerned with ACT, we just think that drawing is the most, like one of the most, or the arts, um, a way to um, engage and expand on um, everything that we're up to, no matter what the discipline. So that's our mission. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk about how you're you're incorporating that sense of motion into the exhibition itself because that's obviously <laughs> a difficult thing to do. Well, um, I wanted to I wanted to create uh, an interactive moment between visitors and objects in the exhibition. So my plan was to have some good mount making engineer create a mount for one of the new ensembles that um, I had commissioned along with a former student that was made in West Africa, is now part of the exhibit. Um, so that when it was being approached by somebody, it would be motion sensed, sensed, <laughs> move. It would move, it would greet the person by doing this kind of side, side, flip, flip. Couldn't do it. Couldn't find anybody to design it because it's a heavy ensemble. So we've resorted to it uh, doing a slow turn uh, under the lights, and the the sequence on it uh, will you know kind of activate it. So that was one one thing that we were doing. And one of the works is uh, um, an installation done by a former student of mine who teaches at the University of Texas, Austin. 
who is a practicing artist, and he has created a series of Egungo installations, and the one that's in our exhibition also turns. So there are going to be two that have some motion. And I'm still working on a, a kind of sound uh, experience as well, because these Egungo are not only dancing and whirling, but they're also praying and singing and blessing. Um, so I'm trying to see if we can do that. Um, they smell too, uh, so I'm hoping you know. But uh, that'll have to be a more minimized. The, 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 the old one of the old installations that's in the in the textile collection has has its um, aura, its smell aura, its uh, from its years of use, and so I we're not going to cover it. So you get up close, you'll smell it. Question. I'm Michael Falk. I'm the general counsel at Wharf, patent lawyer. Um, a humanist too, obviously. What? Do, I think this is for you. So sketching, we all cannot draw, but we can all sketch a little bit. So there's an entree to doing that kind of art. Creating music in the way you do seems beyond most of us without some training. So how do you invite people into that? Well. Um, you know, years ago, uh, I was kind of creating a program here called InterArts and Technology, and that was a big question. Because if you're going to do the music aspect of an InterArts program, um, you can't really go to music. Because music in our culture uh, is primarily a language, and I think that's what you're referencing, mm -hmm. right? Which means you have to know the syntax, you have to know mm -hmm. the vocabulary, which means you have to know scales, you have to of chords, all that stuff. So I thought, geez, that could really limit it and it could make it like a music, electronic music world. So the solution, this is what I'll throw out for you, is that you know you think of sound as the musical material. And therefore, since the late 40s, early 50s, there's this whole world out there that comes out of the French pioneers. It's called musique concrète. Pierre Henri, Pierre Schaeffer, et cetera, et cetera. So that world uh, really means you don't have to know about F sharp diminished seventh and all that stuff. So you just are picking sounds, you're looking at timbres, colors, and therefore my classes like sound design, that's what we do. So the students who don't know, you know music, they, and, and this is really you know, what, what all this stuff is about because it, it is sound design for media, all right? So that means you're just thinking of sound as the building material and you're looking at form, unity, variety, timbre. And with even programs like Audacity, all these kind of things are very doable. And you know, garage band, people can do that. A lot of it's canned. But in the world of sound, um, if you think of it that way and not music, you know, I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I think anybody can do it, and I've found that over all these years of teaching those types of classes, I'm very impressed that some of the better projects come from people without any formal music background. Not always, but they are there, and uh, because this is what's happening around us, so I, I don't think people have to feel restricted, bottom, bottom line. Do any of you other also ever find that in, the, in your media, that students that don't have as much training coming in produce more interesting work? I think about uh, John's uh, concept of unlearning, mm -hmm. um, how I think we're more creative when we first start out and then we are disciplined in various mm -hmm. ways uh, to think in particular paths and actually artists are the ones who continue to try to break out of those limits. Um, I think one of the things that um, I've enjoyed in all of these presentations is um, everybody is interested in the issues of body-mind relationship and how that, how that helps to heal us, to, uh, to bring us back to a kind of wholeness um, that we tend to dismiss or set aside for specific kinds of situations and so on. And, uh, and writing is, is so important, and drawing, it, it's practice, and, it's, and that practice is based in the body, it's gestural. It has to become, I think, gestural to really go deeply.
I would answer that also by saying that um, some of the most interesting things that came out of this workshop were from one woman who said she hated writing, that she was just doing the writing workshop just to kill time. She's like, no offense, but I would much rather we do, but there's nothing else to do here, so I'm gonna be in this writing workshop. And she would kind of stop me and take me aside and try to explain to me how see, she had these cognitive difficulties that went back to childhood that made it not able for her to write. But um, in fact, I don't, I don't think that was the case. I think she had a series of really punitive, terrible experiences with writing and writing teachers in school. So just to echo what you said about um, unlearning. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the work um, for me, and I don't know, you know, if I were asked to draw, I might have a similar, <laughs> a similar response, but part of the work for me was kind of reducing that um, affective fear, you know, and kind of trying to find some ways to invite, invite people in. Mm -hmm. Which sounds similar to what Linda Berry and your, you know, your work is about inviting people in, right? Yeah. It seems like there's something contradictory and maybe a little ironic about talking about unlearning in, in, in the academy, right? Because we're here to codify knowledge, right? To create it and pass it along and to, I mean, right? We are, this is a disciplined area. I guess I just would be curious to hear what you have to say about what it means to hold that contradiction, to embody it, to have it be in your work? Does it, do you find it unsettling or not really something you worry about? I think that's, it's, it's great and I, I think for like for myself, you know, I, I, I think when you, um, if you can unlearn things, it's, it really helps you and that sometimes as a teacher that's part of what we do is put students in an area where what they know doesn't help them even though they're sort of the same thing, but uh, um, just like an art student, if you have them do a drawing, um, or a design student that can't crop it, they're, they're not used to working with the page, whereas an art student might do it that way. And you, if you switched um, approaches in terms of how you laid your sheets out, it's just something simple like that, it just all of a sudden changes the way that you look at it. So you can, you can always find yourself in an unfamiliar situation if you're, if you're a Greek, ancient Greek scholar, uh, go over to the Roman, uh, the Roman history area, and all of a sudden you're just like totally out of your league. You know? and it, and it, so I think though that a lot of academics are uncomfortable doing that, going out of their own area, but I think that when you do that, it's, it creates really cool things. I mean, do you think that there's institutional support? I guess that evidence, there's some evidence about us being here today that we're inching or moving in that direction. Uh, but yeah. often I feel like we're told to stay in our lane. Yeah, I'll speak to that. When I, um, when I first had this experience um, as, as Linda's student, I immediately wanted to give that, that experience that I had to my students and figure out how I could do that. And I was terrified, and I didn't tell anyone for a long time what I was doing until like the, the safe person. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have my classes draw in argumentation and debate, um, and what I, and I collected testimonials from students as evidence just in case because I uh, it it is outside of the box of, of what we normally do even in terms of what counts as creative um, pedagogy, uh, but then eventually uh, enough people saw that it was working that they then started asking me like what's what's happening in your in your class, or how can I do this in my class? But I, I have, was deeply anxious about telling, especially to some of the more traditional um, faculty members in the department, um, that I was going to do this <laughs> in class. And now, but so I, I, and I don't know that that anxiety was necessarily founded. But I think with a different, in a different discipline, uh, I think people do face a lot of um, resistance. I want just to add to that is that. Um, this is drawing from a writing studies scholar who talks about the doubting game and the believing game, that when we read a piece of writing, academically we're often doubting it, we're thinking of like where we can critique it, but he argues for this idea that we should believe, like what if we trained ourselves to believe? So as a writing teacher, what if I read because I was like interested? You know, like, <laughs> what, if I read, what if I designed assignments that I wanted to learn from, and what if I read because I cared, and what if I read with this kind of, cre and what if, what if academic work was about creating knowledge as opposed to critiquing it? So, I mean, I think critique is really important. It gets us places, but I think it's like a muscle, right? Like you were talking about practice. It's a muscle to exercise. 
Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I've learned so much from Yoruba people over the years, um, and they have a wonderful image of what they expect of their artists in whatever form, media it might take. Um, they say that, and this is from my colleague, La Pei, he said that um, Yoruba artists must be are, that is, an itinerant person, stranger everywhere and never quite at home, <laughs> engaged in constant departures of creativity. Isn't that <clears throat> what we expect that artists do? Isn't that that part that's crucial in the healing process? And, uh, you know, the, the Academy gives this lip service to interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinary research. It doesn't help it very often <laughs> to happen, um, but it's something that uh, we try to keep committed to and that I think is the way forward to take, to take us beyond those limits. I think it's really important to be committed to it. Um, I'll just speak from my perspective. So I was a glass blower for 10 years. Um, and now I'm working in comics and drawing and painting, screen printing, um, I've been making art across discipline for like 15 years. And um, I think it's important in art to be able to take a lot of risks. And some of the downfall is within institutions, it's not necessarily always okay to take those risks, um, but it's important to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Henry, what do, you, what do you think are some of the sources of the Yoruba wisdom? What are the sources of it? Yeah. Well, like, every, like in any culture, uh, coming from the deep thinkers, uh, those who you know, have had a world of experiences and managed to translate them into, um, into ideas, uh, objects, songs, dances, words of wisdom this concept of an itinerant person being an artist is, is one of those. Um, one of the interesting things about my work in sensiotics or seeing the importance of the senses is that the sensory experiences that move us up the most are the ones that are beyond words. That's why metaphors become so important because they're, they're, they're expressing the feelings, the emotions, the sensory experiences that are beyond, that they're somehow beyond um, definition in a way. Um, and to me, those are the, those are the things that are, that are the things that we're all kind of continually searching for and the artists put into form. Yaraba's definition of art or ona is evocative form. It's form that takes us to a different place. Can I, can can I just add on to, because I mean, I don't know what you know, but I, I tend to dabble a lot with unlearning, so I mean, <laughs> there's a book coming out called Unlearning, which I'm going to write. Well, I've written it. But anyway, but the, the thing is that here, what we have is really interesting, at least what I take from this, is not only the, the whole pedagogy of unlearning as it is already within the arts, which is an irony, because sometimes you'll find that within the studio, the whole concept of unlearning is always being even iterated, but then, having been an administrator, um, associate dean of art and uh, <laughs> teaching and learning in an art school, uh, it's really difficult to actually move some of the colleagues into, into new curricular kind of ventures, which is, which is a bit of a contradiction. But I mean, it seems to be that kind of, that kind of tension which creates most of the, the, the interesting stuff that happens in art schools. But also, you were talking about the body, you talked a lot about the body. I wonder whether you know, um, you're familiar with um, Schusterman's um, theory, um, aesthetics, where he talks a lot about soma aesthetics, which has to do with the body, the aesthetic of the body of just being. But the concept you're talking about in terms of um, that sphere which lies beyond the word is interesting because um, already in the Thymaeus, um, Plato talks about, or Socrates talks about the Kora, which we take into choreography and all that stuff. And the Kora is neither logos nor mythos. It's neither representation nor word. And as soon as that is articulated, either by word or representation, the Kora disappears. So, I mean, it's this kind of tension that we're always trying to hold on to the Kora, 
which is actually the sound rather than the music or the, the, the image rather, the body rather than the, the word or whatever. But then as soon as we slip back, especially in academia, to try to write about it, to try to kind of give it representation, even paint it, or it, we, lose it. we lose it. So I think it's, it's, it's being on that, that kind of edge of the impossibility of word and image outside of it. But on the other hand, we have to kind of still communicate, we still have to kind of engage with the people that, we are, that are around us, apart from getting a good grade of your student and try to pass the exams. And that's, that's the really interesting uh, tension. But I mean, seeing and you know, listening to these really interesting um, presentations and uh, engaging with the work that you all do, uh, it gives me hope because we do really know how to play within that kind of uh, interstices, if you like, between word image and the rest. And I think that's that's what I take from it. And especially, I like the idea of the you know getting the students to draw, even though they don't draw, or <laughs> getting students to make music or sound, especially because they didn't have. That's that's something which is. Uh, I think that's what we're doing these days, and that's what we should be pushing in terms of the new academia and how we're going forward, rather than get stuck in the past. So. Yeah. Um, so we all see 150 PowerPoints a year, which is like 145 too many, probably. <laughs> all of your art seems perfectly unsuited to a PowerPoint presentation, but you did a great job. <laughs> what in presenting your art through that today? What did you learn anything? Do something different? Probably wasn't the first time you presented the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't done it for what, five years. Oh, and it, okay. it was all new. I said, oh, what's all this stuff? You know, and it made it much easier. I was very surprised how they could, I could do little quick time movies. Yeah. You know, I had to go all through all this yeah. stuff, put it in iMovie and cut and paste. Then, throw it up on these slides, but I thought, wow, this is pretty convenient. It was much easier than I remember doing it. I think I did the last one, a little something, or weird or something, five years ago. I thought, yeah, you know, it, it's clean. I didn't spend a lot of time, obviously, doing fancy shit. I'm sure there are people out there are nuts about this and they go through it, but I thought, okay, it, 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 it works pretty darn well for these kind of things. And you know, People use Prezi and all that, but, you know, can you say it? it's much better than monkeying around with Lots of different files, and you know, it's all there. It's very compact. But I would hate to sit through a lot of these things. You know, <laughs> I think I do more dancing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, um, Sharon Ray, who is yeah. going to be the artist in residence in the in the spring, I had brought her for a symposium I did a couple of years ago called <coughs> Bodily Knowledge. Sensory studies in the 21st century, and one of my presenters danced her presentation. That's Sharon. Um, and it's uh, incredible. Um, one of the other things in the exhibition that I didn't mention, I, maybe I did in passing, because um, I was presenting to you uh, sights and sounds and motion, uh, there'll be a large uh, wall, uh, larger than life size image of. Uh, that excerpt that you saw from the festival in West Africa, um, ably edited by Aaron Granite, right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think on that one for me, I, uh, a lot. I, had, I don't often look back, you know. So this was kind of a, you know, I'm always I'm a forward-looking person, um, and this, my life is sort of without asking for it, it's always been very unstable <laughs> um, as a child and everything. But it, it was interesting to go back and see how, um, maybe they didn't appear to hold together to people, but for me, I was, I was very surprised at some of the connections I had with previous work, and I always thought, well, where did that come from, you know? And, and so that, that was, this particular one was interesting that way to me. I don't usually present that way, so I learned something. It was nice uh, for us to collaborate on a PowerPoint mm -hmm. only. It's sort of a solo venture. Mm -hmm. um, and also nice to put together uh, mostly images for an audience that is not worried about what's the definition for the test. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I'm normally doing. <laughs> <laughs>
and I'm wondering if any of you who uh, work with students teach students art that deals a lot with technology, like you were saying, um, the music interfaces that you use, um, uh, or AutoCAD, um, how do you can bring, like, bring the body or the senses into that? Or is that really more of like a, you know, like a brainstorming phase and then, you know, abstracting that into the, um, into the computer program? Just if you have any insight on that. Or if anyone else does too. Yeah, yeah actually that's, a, that's an area that's always been very interesting to me. And there was a big, uh, especially in the 1980s, there were a lot of debates in the, in the field of architecture about whether computers would even, were even appropriate to use for architecture because it took it away from the body. And so a lot of architects just said, computers are never going to be used, you know. Um, and then, you know, four years later, all of a sudden I'm out of a job because <laughs> uh, everybody was using a computer and I didn't know how, you know. So then I had to learn how to use it. But, I, but I, the, the tension between getting, getting, being controlled by the technology and then Creating something that has a physical or sensory output is something that's always been interesting. I, I've actually, I think I actually wrote a book chapter on that. I forget. <laughs> um, so, uh, as a teacher, then a lot of times I have them move back and forth, and so I'll have people like tape a piece of tracing paper on a computer screen and <laughs> trace over it. So they're, you know, they're, So I try to make sure I try to find ways to bring that physicality in there, um, so it's not just it's not just about having the right software commands. And I always say, you know, you just give them stuff to do that they can't really do. Because um, that's another thing I love to do is use software in ways it wasn't intended. <laughs> you know, Poser is supposed to be photorealistic and I right away thought, well, this could be, make some really fuzzy stuff. Um, so just asking them, giving them assignments that require them to use the, use the technology in a way that it wasn't um, intended often can really help them. Well, and I think people use technology in a lot of different ways. Like I recently worked with an artist who's in his mid-70s and he's had to stop sketching with pencil and paper because of arthritis. So he, ha he can't physically sketch anymore or it causes pain after doing too much of it. So he's moved to sketching on the computer. So he still, he now sketches on the computer but then still paints. So it's kind of this combination, kind of a shift using it as a tool to support something he can't do, but he still then paints from the sketches he makes on the computer. So. There are also two examples I know of. One, I remember in the 90s, when I was back at Junior Academic at Work University, suddenly the, the, the School of Education received or they got a deal and we had these computer suites. And all the subjects needed to kind of offer uh, information technology courses. And I was volunteered, or I think I volunteered myself, to, to be the first one to, to double around and do the... Uh, I remember there was a music colleague who was doing um, the, the one for music, and I had to do the one for the visual arts. And uh, we used um, Hyper Studio in those days, which was actually predating um, PowerPoint. <laughs> and, uh, but in the Hyper Studio, actually, it was very much used in America already. A lot of students, kids, you know, primary school kids, they, were, they weren't able to do a lot of animation and bring in a lot of sound, you know, they could do all sorts of stuff which we actually have seen here, but I mean in much more, uh, very, very quick manner, because I mean you could go around and, uh, although actually it's quite a complicated piece, but I mean you can put it together. And I remember seeing some really interesting stuff, and when, I, when we tried it with our, um, my student teachers, they tried it into the sc in schools, it was a huge success, so we could build on that. And then new technology came in, including PowerPoint and others. But, well, the other example is when I was at uh, New York, um, we were very close, um, we worked a lot with the Harlem Children's Zone. And because we were the arts education department in the Teachers College, um, uh, and we had a couple of students who actually worked with Harlem Children's Zone, Harlem Children's Zone still have, actually, um, and they may, were made fam famous by President Obama as well, because I think they, they, but they do have students, actually, who you know, don't make it in schools. And then they, what they do, they, they, they kind of you know, give them the opportunity to, to engage with, m mostly with the arts. And uh, it was very, uh, I've seen some really interesting projects when these kids actually come together, they learn skills like video skills or music skills, whatever they have, they bring them together and they play to their strengths. And it really gives them the confidence, that some of the, the, you know, the elements you were talking about there, you could see these things coming together um, in a way which without that kind of technology they wouldn't have been able to do. So I mean, I think actually the technology itself becomes a tool 
uh, but it becomes a tool which facilitates certain things which you cannot do without it. So, uh, and you, when you see that kind of thing, the people, you know, these kids could talk to you, they, 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 they would take the lead, they are the producers, they are the writers, they are the, the actors, and they go out there in the community. And uh, it's, it's kind of a marvelous, it was a very mar marvelous um, experience. And I know that they still do it, because that's one of the strengths of the Harlem Children's Zone. So. I, I think it's kind of an interesting balance point, though, too. Yes. Um, because it's one of those things where kind of like what Joe was talking about earlier of like if you don't have a musical background does not mean that you cannot learn about music and sound and that kind of composition and you're you're in the same type of position with that and and I've been too of like um, that technology is a tool but it can't be allowed to be a crutch for for students either for the students who are very good at it or the students who aren't and so, and it needs to become a tool that fosters that creativity and, and not a hindrance to being able to get that project done. Um, and so it, it becomes a really, both in how you um, create those collaborative groups with students and those projects into, um, to be able to create what, what you actually want that learning outcome to be. I wanted to go back to something that our friend from Wharf brought up, which um, I think about a lot, and that is as creatives, um, how the way we talk about our work is as about as uncreative as it can be. And I think it is because we have been forced to adopt this ideology of what professionalism looks like and what the professional um, expectation is of how we present our work, instead of just using the ethos of what you do to tell the story of what it is that you're trying to accomplish, which would be far more interesting, because um, I would have loved to seen Henry dance the, the costumes and tell the story in that way. And, and we're starting to see some of that emerge. You know, in, you referenced Dance Your PhD, which is something that's happening um, more and more these days. And um, so I'm really interested in the investigation of how we, um, how we talk about our work differently. And, and that's what's fun about what Angela's doing in the School of Business, is that she's actually using art to help business people tell their story um, through an artistic lens. Um, so I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, you know, let's let's go back to the, you know, let's go back to that idea and, and sort of screw the ideology of professionalizing how we talk about what we do um, because it evokes somebody's idea of how we're supposed to get tenure or how we're supposed to talk, tell our story and Kind of like code switching. Like if we were in the studio, we'd be doing one thing, but because you know we're here in this academic setting, yes. and <laughs> then we right. should, you know, behave a certain way. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No. Mm -hmm. Lynn, um, I encourage um, the word research um, to libraries and archives and other kinds of sources like that, and I'm wondering. Um, what role libraries or archives play in each of your projects? Well, um, my MFA show is revolving mostly around research done in the library and an archive. Um, <coughs> at the Rare Books and Special Collections in Northern Illinois, and that kind of started a certain direction. So it began with getting the fellowship to be in a library for um, a long period of time. I have to say that uh, I'm very concerned about this issue. Um, after seeing some recent papers from undergraduates that were supposed to be research papers, um, Okay, they're going online, they're using their computers, they go to uh, you know, Wikipedia or Google search, uh, and then they stop. You know, they'll take the first things that turn up on what is becoming uh, a marketplace for you know, who, how do you market the information that you want to present or sell, whether it's true, accurate, researched or not. And the students are stopping there. Uh, so I have 
decided that for this for this my spring courses, they're going to have um, they're going to have some library boot camp <laughs> <laughs> because there are incredible sources for art historians, for visual culturalists, for practicing artists. There's a wealth of visual material, and we have we have access now to what artists are doing everywhere in the world, and it's through the resources in our libraries. But the students are not taking the time to do it, and that, that worries me, because there's a superficiality of investigation that is very disturbing. Um, and it's, I don't know whether it's coming as a result of this whole kind of debate about what is true, what is fake. How does one prove one pos position over another and whether they've given up on the search for some kind of accuracy. So uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of my students in the coming days. <laughs> I might just add, I, I spend a lot of time with secondary research, but um, but as an ethnographer, I also think of people as kind of their own archives, so I do a lot of interview-based and ethnographic research. Um, and, and I think that really complements the teaching because part of the teaching is kind of bringing out those stories, but then they become kind of documented and part of their own archive. Hmm. Yeah, I, I personally use a lot. I, I'll, I'll often have 40 or 50 books out at once <laughs> from the Kohler Library. Mm -hmm. Terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I, but I keep going back and forth. And so if I went on, uh, a lot of what I do is, I, for my own work especially, is I, I study all kinds of, I, I think I, before I met ever met Henry, I came across his articles from, and I was interested in uh, uh, for using photography and ethnography. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I never met him, and then that was years ago. Then I met him, I'm like, oh, I remember reading your article. I mean, it, for, so for me, it's very important. And I guess that's, um, that's, I don't know if it's a generational thing or what, but, but, but I, I, and I make students go, I give them things that they have to, they can't get unless they go to the library, because um, I think it's valuable. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Who has a good meaty question for us to mm -hmm. finish up on? <coughs> or at least finish this portion. Well, why don't we give you another round of applause?